Amen. Well, thank you so much for worshiping with us this morning. Why don't you turn around, maybe greet a few people, say good morning, and then check out this video in just a moment here. Hey everyone, my name is Lily Knopp, and today I wanted to share a word with you that God has been putting on my heart. It highlights the importance of being humble and building community. And I think this is perfectly encapsulated in Philippians 2, verses 2 through 5, which reads, Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. It's natural that we all have goals and dreams, but oftentimes I think it's easy for our own goals and dreams to overshadow our connections with others. This is where the importance of humility comes in. To give some context, at the time Paul was writing this, he was imprisoned, which shows how vital and important Paul thought being humble and building community was, especially when he links both of these ideas within a few verses. And I think the concept of being humble is exaggerated a lot. The dictionary definition of being humble is having a modest or low view of one's own importance. But we can't forget that humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. It's easy to go to two extremes when being humble. We can often put ourselves down um, and often just kind of revel in our own flaws and insecurities. Or on the other end, we can kind of boast about being humble. So I think it's important to find the good middle ground. And with being humble, we can build better connections with other people. We can lift them up. A great example of this is just being in tune with other people, seeing when they're down and reaching out. Maybe that's going out to lunch with them, just giving them a phone call. Or if you see someone who just is celebrating, go out and rejoice with them, encourage them. So I encourage you today to just ask God how you can be humble and build community around you. Gen Z, man, they're taking over. You should get excited about that because that is our future church, guys. Listen, uh, I'm excited about today's message. I was, I was putting some stuff together, bouncing off a little bit of what Lily was saying, and uh, came up with some stuff that I'm ready for. I don't know about you. Are you ready for it? Because uh, some of the things the Lord has shown me in preparing this uh, is not always the um, most encouraging thing. But we have to look at stuff when it comes to ourselves and our relationship with God. We have to examine ourselves and really look at it and go, okay, what areas can I change? Because there are areas where we all need to change. Amen? And so we have to hit those things right up front. And so I want to kind of throw some monkey wrenches in some ideas and some thoughts that we possibly have when it comes to humility. Because that's what Lily was talking about. She was talking about being humble and, and humility. But what do, what do we feel is humble and what does the Bible proclaim as being humble? That, that's what we have to look at. We have to kind of put those together and really parallel those and see if they go together. So if you have your Bibles this morning, turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. Verse 3 and 4, uh, we're going to just jump right in because I have a, a good bit to say today, and I want you to uh, hang on the edge of your seat, get ready for it, and let's, uh, let's discuss some, uh, some issues and some hot topics today, all right? Philippians uh, chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. If you're a parent, you probably really understand this a lot because that's what we have to do when we have kids, right? We, we kind of, a lot of times we put them ahead of ourselves in so many things. Believe me, this weekend I did that. Eve was all over me about wanting to go all these places and I just really didn't want to. You ever been there before? I just really don't. But what did I do? I'm like, okay, I, get, I need to get her out of the house because if not, she's just going to peel the paint off the wall. So I've got to do something. And so I took her, 
We went and had fun. We played, all that kind of thing. And uh, we went to a restaurant that I really don't like because she wanted a specific thing. And so we go there. And, and, you know, it's one of those things where you're like, okay, I, right now what I'm doing is I'm, I'm wallowing in my humility right now because I was humble enough to take my daughter somewhere this weekend that I didn't want to go. That's not what we're supposed to do. All right? That's not what biblical humility is. But when you think of humility, as Lily alluded to, we often think of becoming the lowliest people, right? The lowliest people, almost like a woe is me type mentality, right? For the pure reason of making other people feel special. It, it almost doesn't even go together. Or, as it usually goes, make us feel like we've done something spectacular for someone. We've done something so we are, we are humble because we have done something to make someone else encouraged. That's what we, we go to. That's where our minds go to. And, and listen, I'm going to say this right now. Don't feel bad about it because that is normal. It's normal. But what we do is we need to recognize it so that we can bring it to the Lord and let him change us. That's what we have to do. The human has natural and unnatural feelings, right? We all have natural, we have unnatural feelings. Now, this is where I want to throw a, a monkey wrench and stuff. So I'm going to share with you what our natural feelings are, and I'm just, I think I'm going to even throw them up on the screen. There we go. So our natural feelings are arrogance, narcissism, and offense. That's natural. Our unnatural feelings are humility, servant mindset, and peace-seeking. Those are unnatural. And you're thinking, wait a minute, that doesn't even look right because our natural should be, we're naturally humble, we're naturally wanting to serve other people, and we're naturally seeking peace. But to be honest with you, because of our sin nature, those are the unnatural, and the natural is actually arrogance, narcissism, and offense. Right? So think about that. In each of the natural tendencies we have, there are unnatural ones that would like to take over. There is no way that humility or arrogance is going to let humility take over. Like, there's no way. Because we're naturally narcissistic people, right? We, we want people to know when we've done something good. We want credit for stuff. If I did something good, I want the credit for it. Kind of like the whole Christmas thing. Now, there's kids in the room, so I'm not going to go there, parents. Don't worry. So you're freaking out. I want credit for it, right? You know what I'm saying? Let, read between the lines. Can we do this today? Kids' church is great. Earplugs are great. Whatever you got to do. I want credit. That's my natural tendency. The unnatural tendencies are spiritual. The natural ones are carnal. So let's look for a moment at the natural versus the unnatural. At first glance, the words unnatural or the, the idea of an unnatural thought, our minds race to things that we would never do. It's unnatural to murder, to do drugs, to be violent. Those are unnatural things. However, spiritually speaking, the unnatural things are actually those in which we do the most. Jesus said if you hate someone in your heart, you've murdered them. I would never murder anybody. I bet you've murdered more people than you know. I bet you, I bet, I bet you've got a rap sheet in the spiritual realm. You know what I'm saying? Because a hatred brings that to the surface. Jesus said it himself. If you lust after someone, you've committed adultery with them. I've never done that. I would never do that. But if you lust after them, you have already. Therefore, your unnatural tendencies is to do right. The natural, because of the sin nature, would be to murder, to hate, to be violent, to be lustful. Those are natural tendencies because of our sin nature. Now, let me explain. It is unnatural for me to love someone more than myself. You with me? So Jesus committed the most unnatural action when he died on the cross because he submitted himself as a sacrifice on behalf of all humanity. It was unnatural. It's unnatural for us to love someone more than ourselves. 
to serve other people is unnatural. It's natural because of our sin nature to be narcissistic, to do whatever we want to do, to put ourselves before other people. That is normal. A natural action, because we are born with that sin nature, nature, natural, you get it? We perform in the natural more than the unnatural, which means we are less likely to do the right thing than to do the wrong thing because the wrong thing is the natural thing. Everybody follow that? All right. Let's try it again. We perform, we do stuff in the natural more than the unnatural. Let's put this back on the screen. Keep those in mind, okay, when I say this. We do things more in the natural. Arrogance, narcissism, hatred, lust, all these things. More than we do in the unnatural, which is humility, servant, peace, those kind of things. Which means we are less likely to do the right thing, we are less likely to do the right thing than to do the wrong thing which we are more likely to do, because the wrong thing is actually natural. You with me? Yeah? yeah. Cheap seats over here, you with me? Yeah. Cheap seats back there, you with me? You got your tickets late. <laughs> Romans chapter 3, verse 10 and 12, listen to this. There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have all, or they have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. So our natural tendencies are proud, arrogant, and boastful, as well as easily offended with a revengeful motive. But that can't be in the church, though, right? Can't be in the church. What's your favorite restaurant? Scream it out. <laughs> Woo! Somebody say Taco John's. <laughs> Taco John's. <laughs> Tacos in general. What's your favorite? Come on, somebody, favorite restaurant. Where you at? Boy said McDonald's. A man walks by faith, not by sight, eating McDonald's. <laughs> Texas Roadhouse. We got all kinds of Olive Garden. Man, we could do. My, my daughter would say Culver's. She would scream Culver's, not because it's my last name, but because she just likes it. I don't know why she likes it, but she likes it. Culver's. Where do you want to go to eat? Culver's. I think it's because she knows she gets free ice cream when she gets through eating. I think that's what it is. All right, so a Christian wouldn't behave that way. In the church, think about all those restaurants you just screamed out, right? And some of them are given that this will happen, McDonald's. But um, <laughs> if you go to your favorite restaurant and you find out, and you, you're going to say, you're going to argue with me at first. You're going to jump right back at me at this, but you need to listen because it's true. You can have the worst service possible at that restaurant. They could drop your food on the floor, pick it up, put it back on the plate, and bring it to you. You would get mad. You would say, how dare you do that? That's disgusting. Next week, you'd go back, right? <laughs> Church does one thing that makes you mad. You don't ever come back. You, you hear me? Pastor made me mad. I'm not stepping foot in that church again. He, he said something that was not right. So sue me. Every once in a while, people are going to not say the right things, and we're going to make you mad. But here's the thing. We are supposed to be a family. I don't know anybody that works at those restaurants. I don't know the person in the restaurant. I sure don't know them enough to call them my brother or sister in Christ or in some place that I'm going to spend eternity with that person. But that person, I will go back and see. Somebody at church offends me. I'm done with them. Natural versus unnatural. The unnatural tendency would be 
peace seeking, to have a servant mindset. I'm going to serve that person even when they hurt me. I'm going to have humility. I'm going to place them in a place higher than myself, not because I'm cutting myself down, but because I want them to be built up in the name of Jesus. That's unnatural. The natural is to say, I'm going to be offended with them. I'm going to be upset with them. I'm leaving that church because Billy Bob over here said something that made my wife mad. Billy Bob goes to first service, you start going to second. How about that? Let's <laughs> Peacemaker. Listen, we sound like horrible people. We are. Because of the sin nature within us. But listen, because of Jesus, our lives are changed. We are redeemed, surrounded by grace, and the Holy Spirit is within us. That's why we are called in 2 Corinthians 5.21, we are called the righteousness of God, not because, as some false teachers out there will say, we are not little gods. We are not. He is God. There is one true God, and our righteousness is found only in him. Stop listening to that nonsense. What does this have to do with humility? We had to look at why humility is not natural for us. And that means it's the very reason we should strive for it. Humility might be the most misunderstood virtue of all Christianity. It could be the most misunderstood. It also might be the most important. It might be the most important. 1 Peter 5.5 5 tells us, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the... Come on, everybody's heard it before. Gives grace to the... Everybody together. All right. The interesting thing is that in the Old Testament and the New Testament, the issue of humility appears inseparable from salvation. No, it just got serious. That word and that idea just went to a new level for me. When I was reading this, when I was studying this and looking in the scripture and everything, it went to a new level. Humility, humble, okay, great. But the level it went to when I, when I started reading about how it's actually inseparable from salvation, it scared me a little bit. It, it made me a little nervous. 2 Samuel chapter 22, verse 28, you save a humble people, but your eyes are on the haughty and bring them down. So today, I want to bounce off a little bit of what Lily talked about. And go into the depths a little bit of what humility is. Obviously, it matters, okay? And it could have eternal consequences according to Scripture. There's eternal consequences for a lack of humility according to Scripture. So I want to begin with what biblical humility is not. What biblical humility is not. It is not. Number one, it is not insecurity. It is not insecurity. It's easy to mistake personal insecurity for biblical humility, but they are not the same. They are not. It is, it is not sin to know who you are and know what you're called to. Yeah. That is not sinful. A lack of humility is sinful. Okay? And I'm sorry, but according to Scripture, that and salvation go, to, go together. So there would be a sinfulness about it. A lack of humility. That's not insecurity. It's not the same thing. It's you should know. Like these songs we sing, I'm claiming it today. I'm declaring that I am holy. I am claiming today that I am righteous because of Jesus. I'm proclaiming those things. That's not arrogance. That's not insecurity either. We have to know who we are. Knowing who you are, knowing what you were called to, and being diligent in that calling in the house of God does not mean you are proud any more than retiring means that you're lazy. Did y'all hear that? Come on, some people, especially the retired ones, should be going, yeah! I cut my grass like everybody else. I'm not lazy. Insecurity should never be confused with biblical humility, and neither should indecisiveness. Which leads me to number two. But before that, I love what Lily said in her video. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. I 
love that. It jumped off at me. I was like, what? that's good. That's good. But thinking of yourself less, not thinking less of yourself. Do not do the woe is me. Don't go home and have a pity party over yourself and hope you can make you humble. It can't. It makes you really somebody who don't want to be around. Nobody wants to be around. Seriously. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. Number two, it's not indecisiveness. Jesus preferred men of character and conviction. John the Baptist was this example. Listen to this, Matthew chapter 11. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What then did you go to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is of he of whom it is written. Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has, has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. He was a man of straight lines and hard edges, right? He made bold statements and gave clear direction. He pointed at Jesus and declared him the Savior. Indecisiveness is often nothing more than a failure to take God at his word. Hear this. It is not humility, but can oftentimes be mistaken as such. Well, I'm waiting on the Lord. I'm waiting on the Lord. In my humble opinion. I love that. In my humble opinion. Everybody's got an opinion, and they're mostly not humble. Right? I used to hear when I was growing, everybody's got an opinion. And opinions are like armpits. Everybody has one, they all stink. You ever heard that one before? In my humble opinion. No. When, listen, don't, don't go to Walmart. Hear, hear me. Don't go to Walmart or the mall or wherever you go. God, lead me someone to talk, talk, talk to about you. Don't do that. Why? He's already told you to do it. You'll be standing there staring at the ceiling for hours, waiting for the voice of the Lord to thunder from heaven when he said, I've already told you to go and make disciples, preach the word. I've already told you that. I've anointed you to do that. I've given you the green light to do that. So in my humble opinion or in my humbleness, in my humility, I'm going to wait for the voice of the Lord to tell me to do something. No, if he's already told you to do it, do it. If he's already said to go, go. If he's already said that he has placed his hand on you for such a time as this, go and do it. But we get in these, these places, this indecisiveness, and we disguise it as humility rather than understanding and taking for what it is. And it's actually just us putting off things sometimes. So we've got... We've got insecurity. It's not insecurity. It's not indecisiveness. And number three, it's not inactivity. Inactivity. Playing it safe and hiding your talent is not biblical humility. If, if you can wear a keyboard out, let us know about it. If you can play the drums like, like Noble, let us know about it. I'm sure we could use three or four of you. Right, Noble? Noble? He's like, yes, amen. If you can sing, if you have talent, it's okay to share that. It's okay. Inactivity does not mean you're humble. The Apostle Paul lived his life and executed his ministry almost like a man possessed. Listen to this. I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is within me. 1 Corinthians 15. 
Listen to what he said in Philippians 3. I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Listen to this, 2 Timothy 4. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. So what Paul is saying is, I have done as much as I possibly can. I didn't care who didn't believe in me. I didn't care who got in my way. I did everything possible to raise up people for the kingdom of God, to grow the kingdom of God, to watch the kingdom of God go forward. I did everything I possibly could. I have ran the race. I have kept the faith, and I now stand before God as a good and faithful servant that he's going to enter, that I'm going to enter into eternity. That's what he was saying. But what we do is we go, um, I'm just going to sit and wait. Don't sit and wait. Don't be that sheep. Don't be that sheep that sits so much and eats so much you can't get up. Don't be that sheep. Evangelicals too often look at hardworking person or people and wonder what they're trying to prove. Let's not do that. Are they trying to earn their salvation? Are they trying to merit God's kindness? Are they proud of what they can achieve through will and force of labor? Maybe like the Apostle Paul, they're merely living each day with one eye on the final judgment. Maybe they're looking towards heaven. Maybe they're looking at the kingdom. Maybe they're motivated by the desire to receive from God the greatest commendation of all. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master, Matthew 25. Maybe they're waiting to hear that. Inactivity is not humility. It's rebellion. It's laziness. It's unfaithfulness. That's actually what it is. Commercial break. We talk a lot around here about serving. We talk a lot about serving. VBS last week, I was at VBS. And I watched people, I watched some of you in this room serve kids, serve kids as Jesus would have served people. I watched you do everything you can to, to corral them, to, to keep the, to herd cats. I mean, I watched you do it. We talk about serving. If you're not serving, if you're not serving anywhere, Inactivity does not mean you're humble. It means you're actually rebellious against the kingdom because he tells us in his word to work in the kingdom. Right? Don't take that the wrong way. Some of you are looking at me like, oh, he just did something. Find your place of ministry that God is calling you to and get plugged into it. I'm not asking you to do that. My, my calling or my, my job as the shepherd and the pastor of this church is to grow the kingdom with you, is to teach you, is to show you the ways that we can grow this kingdom together. Serving is one of them. I'm not asking you, hey, can somebody please serve? I'm telling you, it's a commandment of God and it's rebellion if you don't serve. So let's get together, let's work together, let's serve the house of God and watch what he does in this city. Watch what he does to disciple people in this place, in this house. So what is biblical humility? Obviously Jesus is our standard. He's always going to be our standard. What he said and how he lived serves as our guide. True humility means utter dependence on the mercy of God. So what is, what is humility, biblical humility? Number one, it is dependence on God's mercy. It is dependence on God's mercy. To be humble is to be aware of your own sin and unworthiness and to cast yourself entirely upon the mercy and the kindness of God. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said this, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is what Jesus was talking about. People who are poor in spirit are aware of their desperate position and entirely dependent 
upon the mercy and the kindness of God. They are humble in every sense of the word. That's what Jesus was speaking when he says poor in spirit. So the first thing is that it's dependence on God's mercy. The second thing is it's concern or unconcern for power, prestige, and position. You don't have a concern there. That's biblical humility. It's not saying a lack of success, okay? I'm not saying that. But rather the idea of serving others, one of the unnatural tendencies that we often have above ourselves. When I watched those volunteers at VBS last week serve those kids, kids can be disarray, right? They're all over the place. They can be ungrateful, right? They can be rude, demanding, nasty. They stink. <laughs> they talk back. So I'm actually describing a Christian right now. We do that too, right? We do the same thing. But look at it. I watched these volunteers serve well with humility and grace. So if you're in here today, thank you. Thank you for doing that. <laughs> to be humble in a biblical sense is to disregard all concern for rank and privilege and to live one's life in service to the least of these. To accept all, serve all, and prefer all in the name of Christ. So that's the second one. The third thing that biblical humility is, it's unwavering commitment to the authority of the word of God. Unwavering commitment to the authority of the word of God. There's no biblical definition of humility that does not include absolute, unquestioning obedience to the word of God. In Isaiah chapter 66, God says this, but this is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. That's the authority. This is, this is actually the greatest authority in this room. This is the authority in this room. Right? What this says goes. So anything, anything that I say from this platform better line up with this or I'm actually trying to operate in an arrogant authority that's not that of Jesus. And that's a lot of pressure on myself that I put on myself. This includes anybody, from Pastor Beth to anybody else in this room that preaches on this platform. This is the authority. If it's not in this, it should not come from this. Amen. Right? Amen. That's why sometimes I don't feel bad for being a little harsh. Because it came from this, and I can back it up with this. Amen. True biblical humility is one who receives mercy. It is one who receives grace. It is one who concerns themselves with the needs of others and seeks to serve the kingdom of God, even if recognition is absent. Our greatest reward is not found this side of heaven. It is found when we enter into eternity with Jesus and hear those words, well done. That's when it's found. What I really want for people to understand is that humility is realizing that we may not have all the answers, but we know Jesus does, and we accept him as our Savior. That's what it boils down to. Humility is laying down our natural tendencies and picking up the unnatural ones. And that sounds backwards when you think of it in a worldly sense. But it's actually not backwards. Because when you look at that list, the unnatural versus the natural, when you walk with Jesus, they should actually be flipped the other way. And it should be our goal. So this morning, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to challenge you on a couple of things. One, if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, you don't have a relationship with Jesus, 
Listen, here's the thing. We talk about servanthood. We talk about humility and everything. But there's no one that's ever walked the planet more, more humble than Jesus that had more authority. He had the most authority ever and was still the most humble person ever. That's pretty incredible. And that humble person, that person that, that walked in humility like that, who washed his disciples' feet, loves you and loves me. And I'm thankful for that. So if you're here this morning and you don't have a Savior, or let me rephrase that because it almost sounds like I'm saying if you don't have a Savior, we'd like to try to offer you one. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is this. If you don't know the Savior, the only one, and you'd like to today, I'm going to give you this opportunity because I, I try to do this every week. We try to do this every week. I don't know who's sitting here. I don't know where you're at. But if you're here and you say, I, I need to make that decision, would you raise your hand? Just, just raise, We want to put something in your hand. That's why I'm doing this. I don't want to do it. To, I'm not trying to make everybody look at you. But we want to put something in your hand. So I got somebody up here. Um, anybody else? This is bravery time. This is time to get real. Come on. Where are you at? Anybody else? All right. Here's the thing. That's you, even, even if you didn't raise your hand this morning and you say, oh, that's me or whatever. The, the fact of the matter is it's important in your heart. It's a heart thing. It is a heart thing, nothing else. It's not something that you say some kind of simple or, or some kind of magical whatever, or you do something or you whatever. It's not magical. It's spiritual. And God says, you know what? All you have to do is say, within your heart, I accept you as my Savior Today I give you my life, I give you my heart, and I confess my sins, which you do that later with him. You know, you sit there with Jesus one-on-one, say, Jesus, I need forgiveness. I need you to forgive me of this area of my life. I need help in this area of my life. And you give it to him, and you accept him as your Lord and your Savior. He's in charge of your life now, and that's a good thing because you can't do anything alone. So thank you for making that decision today. Anybody else in here that made that decision, that maybe in your heart you said it and you were maybe nervous to do that, whatever, pray those prayers. Be honest with Jesus. Give your heart to him and watch what he does in your life. For everybody else, if you're here and you say, you know what, I need prayer. I want to pray with you because I think every person in this room, myself included, big time, we, we need prayer. We need prayer in, in the area of humility because we're arrogant people by nature. Right? That's just who we are. We're narcissistic people. And um, God's the only one that can set us free from that and change us from that. So, Heavenly Father, today I just ask you, Lord, to help us. The first thing I want to do, Lord, is just praise you and honor you and thank you for those in this room that said yes to Jesus today. Thank you so much, God, for tugging at their hearts by your spirit. And Lord, today I just ask you for all of us, God, who need help, which is, I can guarantee every person in this room, we need your help. We need you, God. Help us to understand true biblical humility. Help us to put aside those, those natural tendencies and pick up the unnatural ones. Because it's so important for us to understand how to serve other people, how to love other people, and and how to love you better. So Lord, I just pray blessing over every person here today. God, that your life or your spirit would be the life that they have. We give you honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen.